I want first of all to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this, uh, uh, this conference, and especially for making it possible for me to be here with you. This is an idea that I've had for a long time, and I remember sharing this idea with Father David Harold Barry that we need to do something on Zarewashi even before he died. That was, uh, but things did not come up. Last year after he died, in fact, I tried uh, to talk to him and he was agreeable to the matter and uh, we were supposed to have some interviews. And then, unfortunately, he decided to die before I came to see him. And then I came up with this idea. I spoke to Father Matsepana about it and we had some correspondence and we were working, thinking, uh, but things did not work out well. So I thought this thing is not going to work. But uh, fortunately, uh, I was surprised to get the uh, invitation to come and be part of this conference. So I'm really sincerely grateful to the organizers. And it's not just about me, but it's about the man himself. I think he would be very happy, he is very happy wherever he is to have this. Often whenever I meet him, he'll come to me and say, you know, Dominic, let me show you this. These are some of the things that you have to share when I'm dead. So I feel like I have a duty and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to express and to share what he said I should share uh, with people after he is, he is gone. So that is why I don't have a very scholarly analysis of anything, but I just want to bring memory. And I think uh, memory is very important because it is what makes us as a community. For us who are Christians, we believe that uh, uh, we are a community of memory. We are here in memoria of an event that happened some time back. And this memoria is invite us to the memory of those people who are beloved to us. So that's why I really want to share um, three things, mostly based on memory. The first thing is about my memory of him, the things that he shared with me, and you know what they mean to me and what I think they can help us to become better people. And also, I would like to share you know, from this memory this black and white relationship uh, in the church, in the society, and in the continent at large. You know, there was an issue about blacks and white, and I think it was something that probably was at the heart of some of the controversies in his life. Um, I think you'll be very happy to hear what Dr. Mabasa said, because uh, in life, uh, he, probably people did not appreciate him, especially those of his own in the Society of Jesus and in the church. Why was he not really that much accepted? Those are some of the things I want to bring out in this relationship between black and white and probably say a little bit about his theology and his spirituality. What kind of, um, uh, what can we learn from there? So let me begin with memory. Um, and my title, which I'm working on, is Remembering Zarevashe, the Lion Mazi, the lion that refused to be placed in a game park. Because I think there was a lot of really certain understanding of conventions that people are supposed to follow, but he opted out of those, and that's caused a bit of controversy in his life. And what I remember very well was at the funeral. Uh, the fact was that his funeral was at Breastside. We were told that he was at Breastside for twice and eventually died from there, and his funeral was at Breastside. And I remember him when we were burying another Jesuit at the same place, and he had lived with this Jesuit previously. And while they were there, the, I think life was not that uh, uh, smooth for them. They did not actually go well. And uh, Father Zwarewashe was really surprised about the things that were being said about this particular Jesuit. And he turned to me, I remember, I said, you know, Taurai Choko Adigut Munafambe Zwaganagawe. <laughs> he was kind of very critical of a lot of good things that were being said about this man, but from him and from other people, they say this man was not as good and as beautiful as people were saying, and they said, ah. And so I want to bring some of these controversial issues. Maybe they are not the truth. There are people, the family is here, and other people who are here who know and understand him better than we do. But at least the truth from my own perspective of things that he shared with me and of what I heard other people say. 
if the told be to, if the truth is to be told, I don't think Zwarewashi was appreciated by his own in the Society of Jesus and in the church as much as was expressed at the funeral. There was a lot of you know good things. You know, he was a great writer. He was this thing, but in real life, you know, I don't think people actually appreciate. I remember once in 1999 when I was in the novitiate, and I met the assistant to Father General of the Society in Africa, in Rome. And I told him that I wanted to write something of the spiritual exercises in Shona. And he said, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't you ask Father Zwarewashe to help you? I think he writes very good Shona books. Uh, but I think that's the only good thing he does. I hope it was a joke. <laughs> because <laughs> it just made me think, why? What do they think of uh, Zarewashe in Rome if this man is saying certain things like that? So I said, okay, let me put that aside. Many years later, I was here in Harare assisting at a parish, and I met some parishioners who uh, wanted to invite him to come and speak about our mother Mary. You know, that devotion was very special to him. He wrote other books about Mary, the devotion to Mary. And then... Uh, the parish priest then said, oh, I don't think it's a good idea. That man is a loose cannon, and he was never invited. That so again, I kind of picked up that there was some kind of uh, things happening there that people did not approve of. And I spoke to another fellow Jesuit nicely the other time about this plan that we should actually do something about Zarewashe and write, you know, uh, write up about him and do more research on him as Dr. Mabasa was suggesting. And they said, mm, probably that would be very difficult because that man was a bit imprudent and he did something that might cause a bit of some stir. And again, I picked the same sentiments that, you know, he, he, he robbed some boats and people might not be. And I can tell you that a few times I know that for sure from him that uh, a few times he wanted to offer a course or two, either here when it was Arupe College or where I am working at Ekima College. I said, can I offer one or two? But the people there were not really very happy to invite him to understand, you know, uh, to understand. And I, that's where the question was coming from. Was this man misunderstood or was he mischievous? Why is it that people were really not taking him on? Whereas I felt that, you know, there is something in this man that is deep. These are some of the, moments and the questions that remained unanswered. And you were saying that, uh, well, probably he was, um, what is it? He, was, um, he moved into English and he messed up. I think it was not the English thing. There was something deeper that, was, uh, that he was stirring, some controversy that he was bringing up that made uh, some people very uncomfortable. I first met Zarevashe through his writings. And grateful, when I was a grateful people, I won as the first prize uh, one of his books, Kurawone. And it captured my imagination. You, the things that, you know, Dr. Mabasa was talking about, how he can get into your imagination. And later on, I discovered another book, Gonao Potera, which is also very captivating. And that book was a set book when I was studying, um, uh, when I was studying, uh, when I was in A-level studying Shona. So we had to start um, um, Gonao Potera. I discovered more books later on. Guarare Namo, which was his favorite, because he kept on trying. You must read Guarare Namo. You must read Guarare Namo. Then others came up again. Museo Odanyama. I read all of them. And I also liked his poetry. Uh, this is uh, my favorite two poems. Dagarora uh, Honzagureva Garane Akat. And then another one is Urichi Gamba I think I would recite them over and over again. And also I read some of his poetry, Shumo Chimbo Namadi Mikira. Those have been mentioned and has been analyzed very well and their significance has been presented to us. And even in Gano, he was a good storyteller. And you know, it fascinated me to know of a priest who will be very much in love with culture, with language, and expresses him there. And I said, well, I really would like to meet this man. And I must admit that when I met him for the first time, 
I was not so much impressed by the man as much as I was impressed by his books. <laughs> it happens sometimes that you can read somebody and you are taken up, but when you meet the person, I kind of... Uh, but it was not anything about him, uh, but uh, he was just overwhelming, and he would take you over, you know. First of all, he just doesn't say, who are you? He say, I'm Dominic. The first thing he asked, what is that? And then you say, ah, Ziva. And then he starts a whole poem about your totem. Ah, Ziva Sambiri. Horeri Mudenga. Vachirera Nerera Nezawamwe. He will just compose everything there. So, and then he will be telling stories and to stories. He was, and stories was not just, a, it was really part of his life. I remember one time I saw him. He, I was coming from one of our houses there, Garnet, and I saw his car parked in the car park, and I said, no, there is the man. I dashed across to hide in the next house there, and somebody saw me, he didn't ask me, uh, what, what are you rushing to? He just said, Urgutize. And they knew that, I said, oh, Father Zarewashe is there, and if he sees me, I won't be able to go anywhere. <laughs> You'll be telling me stories. But it was in a nice way, but sometimes overwhelming. So when I met him for the first time, uh, that was in 1999, and we were, I was in the novitiate then, going through an experience that he had gone through about 30 years later. He was in the novitiate in 1969, and so he had so many stories to tell about the novitiate. And um, I didn't have anywhere to go, so I, at the time, at that time I was not feeling well, and so I was just, and he would come to me and tell me uh, the stories that was, um, well. And at that time, that is when I had written this book, which I thought I would publish. And it had been given to him by Father David Harold Barry to see if it is publishable. And he said, it's a good book, just change this and this, and then it can be published. But I don't know what happened to that, maybe, I'll publish it when I go to Rika's house. <laughs> so that was the time. So he was very much impressed. And many years later, he went back to the novitiate as a assistant novice master. Uh, he did not last long there. I think things did not work well. And he was unceremoniously driven back to Harare. And I know the man who drove him. He said all the way from Lusaka to Harare, he was always talking about, you know, I was not prepared to play a second fiddle in that novitiate, and that novitiate was reeking of racism, and he was not going to stand that. And so it was that a problem. Another incident, you know, after his own novitiate, he went to DRC Congo for philosophy, as was the situation there, but there was some issue in the family, I think some relation was not feeling well here to come back. So when he came back, that's when he went to uh, Shawasha Seminary to finish his studies. So this is where the story became interesting, because at Shawasha, there were problems with some of the rectors and everything was happening, and the students, the seminarians, they went on strike, and he was among the one who went on strike. And um, they were demanding that the rector should actually resign. And one fellow Jesuit, I said, was there. He went to, uh, to see the super his superiors and said, you know, Zarewashi Ignatius is the one who is leading the Chimurenga there. In fact, we have heard him saying that uh, um, there's a time for everything. There's a time to fear the white man, and there's a time not to fear the white man. And people were uh, excited. Well, I asked him about it, and he said, ah, that story, I don't know anything, but all I know is I could not let the other uh, seminarians struggle and take one side. If you want to know more about that incident, you can read it in a book by Nicholas Creary. I think it's, um, the book is called The Jesuits and the Enculturation of the Catholic Church in Zimbabwe. What actually happened there, and some who have been with him, they know uh, what happens there. So after the dismissal from Chishawasha, all the seminarians were dismissed and he was among them. And he was taken and was sent to St. Michael's Mondoro uh, to do part of his training there. And again, he got into trouble for not coming for meals. 
And I asked him, was it true that you did not go for bills? He said, no, I was supervising evening study, so I could not be in two places at the same time. <laughs> so, but he was very appreciative of that time in, in that place because he said, uh, uh, there was a father, Ray Armstrong, I think, was the superior, said, at least he wrote a very nice report about me. That's how I was allowed to go for further studies. So he went to Britain for his further studies there. And um, he did his masters. And um, um, I mean, after he, fi I mean, he, fi he just did first uh, studies, theology. Then he came back for his ordination, which was at St. Peter's Barry, 1979. We've already been told about that. And um, Father Vonida was there. He can tell you everything about that ordination. And then I think he went to Rome to do a master's there in theology. But after he finished, he wanted to proceed and do a PhD. But his provincial told him, you did not join the society to do studies. Come back and work. <laughs> and he was not very much amused by that. Because he said, no, this, uh, other people are allowed for studies, but I'm not allowed. So there was always this struggle within him uh, about where he felt there was a lot of racism and he was being targeted. So. And I know he struggled very much towards the, end of, um, um, towards the end of his life. The last book, which I was very much commended for, is uh, uh, he really struggled from the superiors to the publishers to get it published. Eventually it was published. And um, he had another one which he was working on, in which I had actually asked him, why don't you write something on uh, racism? And he said, yes, I'm writing on racism and the church and wants to get it published, but I could see that it was not going anywhere, and he died before he published that one. I hope it will see the sunlight sometime. So from all these encounters, from all these people I hear people say, I can safely say that, you know, either this man was very misunderstood, or he was mischievous, and I'm not going to answer that question. But I know that he caused a lot of disquiet, but I want to point out that it is in this disquiet that we can be able to appreciate the man and his contribution. And in theology and in poetry and in literature, it was not really just trying to say the nice things. And we have to locate ourselves in these movements. I don't know how best we can do that. But the major issue that dominated this disquiet was the issue of racism. And I would like to talk a little bit more about that issue because uh, it has to do with the black and white relationship within the church and within the country and within the continent. You know, he had a favorite uh, word for this, Karaba. And this is from Kalaba. He said, ah, uyo, ane Karaba. He said, ah, ane Karaba. And Karaba for him had nothing to do with black and white. Even some blacks who were not doing what they were segregating others, they were also labeled Karaba. <laughs> and this issue of Karaba, that is the issue that caused a bit of anger. And it is well articulated in an article that he wrote in a manga, EFA, African, uh, was it African Ecclesial Review. And the title of the article is Racist Missionaries, an Obstacle to Evangelization in Africa. And he wrote that, and basically what he says there was that expatriate bishops are self-serving in their charity work. He argued that they had no moral authority to criticize political leaders who hold on to power because they do the same thing. And he categorically demanded that they should resign and allow local clergy to take over. <laughs> That's as his statement there. And I, he's the one who showed me that article when I was at Brayside one time. And he shared with me how he suffered after the article was published. He was summoned and reprimanded several times by his then provision. And he was forced to write an apology and to admit that he was angry when he wrote the article. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the article. And the apology came up in one of the F. I think I have a copy somewhere there. And this is what he says. I, I would like to apologize sincerely to all those who were offended by my article, especially expatriates and non-expatriates in Zimbabwe and elsewhere. 
I wrote the article in anger, some of the language being almost racist itself or giving that impression. My intention was not to hurt your feelings, but to challenge us all to the genuine demands of the gospel, which requires us all to abolish all forms of racism, black or white, so we can truly live as brothers and sisters in Christ. If I gave my article the present title, my original title was Racism Still Lingers in the Church in Zimbabwe. Thank you for pardoning me. <laughs> so I leave it to you to, uh, to give your verdict on this apology. But what I remember most was how he was amused by the entire incident. He was no bitterness. He was laughing as he showed me that. Especially one part where he said, Dominic, look at this. This is what I wrote. And this is what he wrote. A look into the history of the church in Africa reveals that African bishops were appointed, when appointed to replace the expatriates, they have to go to Europe for endorsement. Their common prayer then was this petition. Our fathers who art in Europe, how Lord be your money, may your generosity continue to come down on us. <laughs> and I remember him rolling with laughter. He said, this one, they didn't like it. <laughs> you know, he also expressed the same joy. He was telling me of one fellow Jesuit was white working in close to some place, in a rural place where his relatives were. And there was an issue of witchcraft which revolved some of his relations. And I don't know how this Jesuit was commenting on witchcraft and I said, ah, Dominic, I told him, that man, I said, are ah, you? You don't have authority to comment about witchcraft. Go to Europe and solve the problems of pornography there. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember him enjoying himself as he shared all these stories. Fortunately, I met another Jesuit who had nothing positive to say about him, but he, uh, inadvertently, I think he, he corroborated what most of the things that are... So, I don't know whether to say, you know, he was mischievous, because he would show some of these signs when he laughs at people and says what he has done, or whether he was just misunderstood. I gave this reflection to fellow Jesuit, and this is what he said uh, um, about him. He knew him very well. He said, I would say to some extent he was misunderstood, especially by whites who didn't grasp the deeply insulting and hateful behavior that prevailed against the blacks at the time. It accounts for a lot of his reactions. I don't think he was deliberately a mischief maker. I think he reacted out of his woundedness, which created a certain mental and psychological imbalance in him. I did sometimes feel there was something pathological and paranoid about him. Sadly, he couldn't go over the experiences of racialism as most other older black Jesuits did. He clung onto his wounds and he had a huge chip on his shoulder. This is a statement from someone who knows him well, so I can't contest it, but I would like to say from the little that I know of him, this was no man who had a psychological imbalance at all. This is a man who was just reacting and trying to seek for justice to what was, uh, what was happening there. You know, this whole experience of racialism, of black and white relationship, is probably not a big issue now as it was then, at least for us in Zimbabwe. But we are not free from the racialism expressed in places like America, or this uh, Black Lives Matter movement. And what we hear from what happens close at home in South Africa. So we cannot dismiss it as something of the past. Our challenge is now is how do we want to reflect and memorialize the experience of people like Zarewash? And how such memories can help us to be more aware of the racialism of our time. Those in the know can maintain that he reacted out of woundedness that causes psychological imbalances. Such an argument probably is similar to what we find in Franz Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth. But we need to go beyond diagnosing mental trauma and reflect meaningfully a meaningful action that comes from such experience. And I think that's what Franz Fanon was trying to do. 
And apart from using Zwariwache's experience to reflect on racism in the world, his experience is very crucial in reflecting the decolonizing process efforts in Africa. The racial experiences that the likes of Zwariwache went through have left an indelible mark on the nation's socio-political culture. Those of us who have been around for a while can notice that uh, the politics of this country is marked by the them and us discourse, in which one part tried to get to political mileage by undermining the other. The experiences of people like Zwariwache can be a good place to reflect on how we can embark on a nation building from experiences rather than theories. And this experience is also important for the church's <coughs> self-reflection. The church has to reflect on its own complicity in racial, economic, and political marginalization. Maybe the church should take an initiative and be the first to ask for apologies. Hopefully this might stand and might, might, st might put an end to the Chimurenga for Chimurenga. That has characterized Zimbabwe history in 1980. What I see in this Zimbabwean history is this whole thing of wanting to say, oh, we also did during the Chimrenga. We also did that. We also did that. But very few people want to take responsibility and say, we are also responsible for the dark side of this entire process. And if the church takes an initiative to say, no, we were not as great as we say we are, and other people can start really talking about their own responsibilities, then maybe we can find some, res some resolution and some reconciliation instead of just fighting for Chimurenga. Now let me just quickly move on to theology and finish very fast. Um, the same Jesuit who commented about his psychological imbalance is that this to say about him, uh, his writings. And he said, all in all, I don't doubt that he was very talented as a Shona writer. Those in the know, speak highly of his novels, but I don't think much of his theological writings. I must admit and confess that I once held this view. I, there, there was a time when I felt, no, Zarewashe is a good Shona writer, but theologically is not that great. I probably should just stick with Shona. And he wrote a book, the last book, a short investigation uh, of the history of the Catholic Church from the Council of Jerusalem to the Council of Trent. It is a tradition in the Society of Jesus that when you write a book, it must be approved by your superiors, and the superiors can give it to someone who has to look at it for theology, dogma, and stuff. And that book was given to me. I read it. And uh, my recommendation was that it should not be published. <laughs> I wrote a 10 page, re uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, article uh, uh, response why it should not be published. I thought, no, he has not gone deeper into theological issues as such. And the provincial asked me, can you please talk to him about it? I said, no, I can't. <laughs> I, uh, but what the provisional did, he took that right up and then he gave it to him and said, look here, this is what Dominic has said about your thing. And then he came to me and said, are you saying that he should go deeper? Can you tell me how best I can go deeper? <laughs> and I was a little bit hesitant. I said, if you try to read this article, maybe you can go some of the issues there. And he, I don't know, he just disappeared. Then I was surprised. He, came, right, he wrote to me and said, Dominic, that book of mine is being published by Mambo Press. Would you like to suggest a cover page? I said, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And if you see that cover page, well, the book we said is all about apology. The church has to apologize. That's why I cited that cover page with, cover page with the Pope uh, asking for forgiveness. Then I had the book, uh, he sent the book to me later on, and uh, I think he sold about uh, three copies somewhere, and he gave me $20 and said, thank you for helping me. <laughs> and I remember I looked at the book, and I was acknowledged. And I said, I also want to thank Father Dominic Thompson. Father Dominic Thompson was the one who was suggested by the provincial to look at the scripts. It seems that he examined the draft attentively and with eagerness. 
and then gave a frank and constructive criticism of the book without mincing his words. He encouraged me to take a deeper research. Uh, if you read this carefully, you can tell that he was not very happy because uh, <laughs> without mincing his words, I, 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 I don't think I wrote that. But uh, I, anyway, as time goes, I, I, used, I used to think probably he could do well in Shona literature and Shona what we had, but maybe theology, no. But it was because of this very snobbish understanding of what theology should do. I think I've repeated now, and I know there was a lot of theology in his writing. It's just that it didn't fit this old dogmatic Aquinas or Balthazar or Ranarian way of doing theology. His theology had to, was rooted in his experience. And this is the theology that we need to do. I think um, discourse on African theology has to go beyond the definitions and conceptions or the struggle with specification and requirements of dogmatics or systematics. That's not the way only theology could. There are other ways, methodological new ways that can be explored. And, and I think he was bringing that very well. Uh, it, it must be, this theology, African theology, must be connected to an individual experience, to biograph. And I am now of the opinion opinion that biograph is very important in any theological discourse. It's not somewhere that is up there. It is key in understanding. Zwane Wash's life, you know, and his whole writing, express the deep desire for the church in Africa to be truly African. And I'll tell you, because of this desire, he suffered greatly. He is part of a generation of Catholic priests who gave their lives to make the church African. If you know, you can talk of Jean Makela, Fabian Busi Bulaga, Laurent Magesa, Menrad Hegba, Andrew Benveng, Charles Nyamiti. There was a whole, uh, I mean, tribe of, um, uh, of, of theologians who tried to teach her, and they suffered. For Zarevash, I see him as the man with far reaching eyes who saw that in Christianity, there is something deeper than the European garb that it came within us. And it had to be kind of shaded away and try to really express it and weave it in our own way of doing things, in those African knowledge systems. And uh, I'm sorry to say he paid heavily for that. There's a story that I heard, and I think he has not denied or confirmed it, when he was in Zambia for the second time as assistant novice master, there was a scholar who came from, I don't know, America or Britain, and he was talking about enculturation. And he had read that book about um, authentic enculturation and reconciliation, a Catholic perspective. And he was really commenting it highly that, you know, Zarewashe wrote very well, and this is good, and this is what needs to happen. And Zarewashe, as usual, he raised his hand to ask a question, and he commented, and he told him, no, you don't understand Zarewashe, you. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly that is there. Well, he didn't pursue it further, but later on, somebody went to the school and said, do you know the Zarewashe that you were commenting? He said, no, I don't know him, but he writes very well. He said, that man that you were dismissing is the Zarewashe. <laughs> oh. By the way, <laughs> He writes very well, but he doesn't seem to articulate himself very well in speech. <laughs> For me, that was a very good expression of uh, what Jean Makela called, you know, people, they always think of theology as a text. They forget that the word became flesh. The word became flesh and experiences to go in that way. Uh, let me finish with this thing that, you know, theology has to do with spirituality. For those of us who are theologians, we know that if you want to understand great theologians like Aquinas, like Bonaventure, go to the spiritualities behind them. For Aquinas, go to St. Dominic. For Bonaventure, go to St. Francis. For Rana, go to St. Ignatius. This is the spirituality that they try to express. Now. For Ignatius, it was the same thing. He was a deeply spiritual person. His theology was not just coming for that he wanted. He was trying to get the Jesuit and Ignatian uh, spirituality. And he freely obeyed. 
And another dimension of his theology is that theology has to be pastoral. You can't just be in class and do your, and read your pep books, uh, theologians, and then you think you can actually say what theology has to do. If you are not grounded in the experience of the people, if you are not a pastor, he was a pastor for many years, and that pastoral experience is what he, experienced, what he expressed in his theology, and it went beyond the people he encountered. Once I met a certain old woman in my place there from Bari, and she was uh, old and elderly. She had somebody who helped her to read, and I, uh, to, who read books to her. And I said, oh, what are you reading? I said, no, this is uh, the book by Father Zware Washembiri Marwaza Mambo Ideso Christo. And it speaks to me, it speaks to who I am. And there was a lot of spirituality. And this is the foundation Pastoral work, spirituality is the foundation of a true and genuine theology. You know, you know Bishop Munyongani, he used to tell me that Bishop Munyongani, before he was bishop, I think, that he used to laugh at him and say, Swarewashe, you are writing stories of Tsuronagudu, the hare and the baboon. Please write about faith. But I think if we are serious, there was a lot of faith and spirituality in his Tsuronagudu stories. So I do not wish, let me conclude by saying that, I do not wish to canonize him. As Dorothy Day says, if we canonize him, you are dismissing him. I do not wish to write a hagiography on him, because the geography is all these nice, pious stories about holy men and women. If you do that, you will minimize him. He was an ordinary man, probably with many faults. But I just wish to draw our attention to the complexity in his life. That can help us appreciate the complexity in every being, male or female, black or white. What moves this world is complexity. And anyone who tries to give a simple explanation to the complexity in our world is doing us a lot of injustice. May the complexity of his life help us to see the complexity in every being. Thank you very much.